Um, I'm Ariel Lauren Wilson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Edible Manhattan and Edible Brooklyn. Um, and I'm also the program director for Food Loves Tech. I come up with the panel series and um, help decide who, who actually sits on these. Um, I do want to say, if conversations like the one we're having this weekend are of interest to you, we launched a podcast yesterday called In the Field with Edible Brooklyn. And um, our first season is a five-part series that really explores where food and technology meet. So if you like what you have here, subscribe, please, wherever you find your podcasts. Um, but with that said, I want to let Jen, our moderator, uh, get us kicked off today um, to talk about the next generation of food and ag tech. Um, go, go ahead, Jen. All right, thank you. Um, so like Lauren said, my name is Jennifer Goggin. I am a co-founder of Startle, which is an innovation studio for the food ecosystem. Um, and I'm joined here today by six very interesting panelists, all working on a slightly different aspect of uh, next generation technology in the food space. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick uh, rundown of, of who everybody is up here, and then we'll start with some questions on everybody's particular area of focus, and then I hope that the other panelists will jump in to give their thoughts on that topic as well. Um, so to my left, I have Daniel Beckman, who's the co-founder of Foodshed.io, which is a market and logistics platform for local food. Uh, next to him, I have Kim Husky, the food services program manager at Google. Then I have Deepak Sekar, the founder and CEO of Chowbotics. Um, then there's Maggie Copelentz, this from the Space Exploration Initiative at MIT's Media Lab. Um, then we have Jason Green, who's the founder and CEO of Eden Works, which is an aquaponic vertical farm in Brooklyn. Um, and then finally, we have Shen Tong down there from Food Future Co., uh, which is a startup um, accelerator for the, food, for, for the food space, for food companies. Um, so we'll jump right in, going a little randomly this morning, and we'll start with Deepak. Uh, so a question that my, my partner always asks when we're looking at new technologies or new initiatives to explore is why. So why does the world, why does the industry, why do consumers need this new technology and how can it change the food system for the better? Um, so for, I want to ask you what your long-term vision is for robotics in the food space um, and how can it help change our food system beyond just um, decreasing labor costs, for example. Yeah, how many of you uh, have actually seen a robot make food? Did you see it in the building next door yesterday? Uh, we, we have a robot out there. But pretty much every one of you has eaten food made by a robot already. Anytime you get tortillas from the grocery store, those were made by robots. Uh, anytime you get frozen food in the grocery store, those were made by robots as well. And robots have been making these food types the last 10 years. What's happening right now is that robots are becoming smaller and smaller. They're becoming less expensive. Prices for robots have gone way down. They've gone down by 5x in the past five years. So, and, and any time prices for a technology go down, you start seeing more and more market adoption. So in the next five to 10 years, people expect robots are gonna be making food in cafeterias and restaurants and hotels and a whole bunch of other places. Now, the question is why, right? Uh, and it's not just the labor cost reduction. I'll give you a couple of examples to explain why. Uh, for example, with our robot, uh, our robot's called Sally. Uh, uh, we put it in a bunch of hospitals. Uh, and with hospitals, what happens is uh, if you have a salad bar out there, then if someone's sick and they go touch the spoons uh, or food in a salad bar, they can make others sick. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a health hazard. Now, if you have a robot, uh, uh, and if you go to the next building, you'll see how the robot's designed. The end customer does not touch the spoons or the food, so it's a lot more hygienic. Another benefit is uh, a robot doesn't need to sleep, so it's available 24 seven, so if you're going to a hospital late in the night, you can actually get food. Uh, and uh, we're seeing other uses as well. The food stays fresh far longer than in a salad bar. In a salad bar, for example, it, the food's all open to the air, the romaine starts browning after a day or so, while in uh, a robot like ours, uh, uh, you can keep the food fresh for three days because it's all like an, it's stored in a refrigerated compartment and it's airtight. So robots have other benefits. Uh, I can give you one more example as well. We put uh, our robot in a convenience store in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, entree size salad costs $3.49. It's the lowest price entree salad in Silicon Valley. And it's not just because uh, uh, you're reducing the labor involvement. It's also because these convenience stores used to get uh, 
food packaged by a third party vendor who used to get 40% margins. Uh, by putting this robot in the convenience store, you could eliminate this middleman in the supply chain. Uh, and you could get produced directly from Cisco and put it inside uh, Sally. And because you eliminated a step in the supply chain, your food becomes less expensive. Now, the benefit of having less expensive food is huge, right? There's so many people struggling to get healthy food, struggling to get food in the first place. And if the cost of food goes down quite a bit because of innovations like this, you're going to make the world a much better place, I believe. Anybody else have thoughts on robotics or other similar technology? Well, um, Kim from Google. Um, Deepak, we have piloted some of your Sally's in, um, in our environment, in our corporate food service environment. And the labor issue is, is an issue. Um, and we see it as though being able to provide better, more efficient, productive work workforces. So if we're not hiring dishwashers or, or maybe lower skills, like these, these folks we can train and help improve like more holistically uh, the, our entire environment. So it's, a, it's another add to what everything that you spoke about. Right. And I've, I've also noticed uh, uh, many companies have data centers all over the country and the data centers are in remote locations where it's hard to get labor. And That's right. Uh, data centers need to be staffed 24-7 uh, and people working late night shifts don't have access to food as well. Uh, uh, and they eat junk food from vending machines and put on weight. Uh, but if you put some of these robots in there, you can get fresh food uh, late in the night as well, I believe. I actually, I want to ask Deepak a, a question, um, which is that uh, in, in the, the first example that you shared of the hospital environment, um, the motivation there is largely around food safety, not specifically economics. Um, Kim was, able to, Kim was able to share her perspective from Google. I'm wondering, um, as you think about wider spread market adoption, uh, food service has historically, especially when you think about small scale food service as opposed to either corporate food service um, or chain uh, retail food service, um, has been a market that is starved of capital. Um, it is very hard to get, uh, to get a loan to start a food service business. Um, if the, if the opportunity is to reduce your cost of labor by increasing the upfront capital expenditures, doesn't that, it, 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 at least not knowing much about, about your, your business, um, it seems like it's creating a hurdle for competitiveness that actually starting a food service business gets harder because you need more upfront capital as opposed to having the amortized cost of labor uh, over the life of the business. Yeah, we also offer monthly rent options for these machines. Everyone wants recurring revenue. It's better than asking people to pay a lot of money up front. And if you look at uh, uh, the monthly cost, uh, it comes to the equivalent of dollar one per hour with these robots. So you can get a monthly cost model with these things and address the problem you bring up. Okay, um, so now let's turn to the, um, the food supply chain. Uh, Daniel, this question will start out with you. Um, so ever since I started in the food industry, there's been this tension between the desire to strengthen the market for local food, particularly grown by smaller family farms, and then the charge that this food is often um, more expensive and, and really only for the people that A, care where their food comes from and B, can afford to actually go out of their way to these alternate channels to get them. Um, so I'm curious to know how you see technology being able to kind of bridge that gap and making local and or food from small family farms more accessible and affordable without simply decreasing the price that the farms receive. Yeah, this is kind of the mission that I'm on. I, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I think I come from the perspective that a lot of Americans have. Uh, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and fun fruits and fruit roll-ups were considered fruits and vegetables where I grew up. Uh, that's kind of what I had. Um, the produce that we had there uh, had no flavor. Um, it generally wasn't very good. I was convinced that where we were at in Ohio, we were actually getting worse things than Dayton. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody in this room, but uh, you just kind of give up on the produce section uh, in a lot of places in this country, and I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. 
Uh, I live in, I lived here in Brooklyn and also in San Francisco and clearly uh, these communities have a different perspective in certain areas of this community. I would say um, surprisingly in California, especially because in the Central Valley we grow most of this stuff, um, that people still get their groceries at places like Safeway, um, you know, Ralph's, Vons, Albertsons, these big mainstream grocery chains, they get it from restaurants that they go to. So one of the reasons that it has been so expensive is that there isn't enough scale to really make this work. And there really isn't a lot of infrastructure uh, that's even built or even available for independent farms that are growing food for people uh, in a regenerative way to reach the market. There are a lot of challenges between uh, when you're a farm and, and getting into all of these places. And we've been working here in New York City, and uh, more recently we've been working in Missouri. And I generally, when I, when I leave uh, Brooklyn or when I leave San Francisco, people want to give me a suitcase of you should tell them. <laughs> and uh, you should tell them this about what they're eating. You should tell them that they should realize this. And the truth is, in most of these places in, in the world, but in the country, like people are, are focusing on many other things, and, and the suitcase of shouldas is actually very condescending. Uh, I go to inner city St. Louis, and I see people buying produce there, and uh, they're trying to do the best that they can with what's available to them. Uh, sometimes there are budgetary issues, and sometimes it's uh, time. Uh, and then there are other racial issues, frankly, that are actually permeating into our food chain. So what we've been able to do, and it was shocking to me because I just simply tried, uh, we were able to find a price that the farmers actually just gave us uh, in that area for what they wanted. And then in going to the major grocery chains in that region, uh, we were able to negotiate a price with them that they wanted. And what we're doing is we're just replacing what's on the shelf uh, with stuff already. I think that we're standing on the shoulders of giants and people that have worked in this space for a while. I don't think that we're the first people to, to, to start working in those places. Um, but right now, I think we're able to just do this if we don't preserve the precious nature of the profit margins of organic. And I can get into lots of details about this, but um, at the end of the day, if we just replace the onions, <laughs> it, the game is over. We don't have to talk about it being in the future anymore. Uh, and we are able to replace the onions at or near the same price that everybody's used to paying uh, in the conventional side. Uh, and sure, uh, we may not have the certification uh, of organic and everything, but it's being grown that way. Uh, so that's, that's what we've been working on. And in terms of technology, where the savings are, most of these farms right now if they're aggregating to meet the minimums for a lot of these places, which is something that's a very old practice that we're not introducing to the situation at all. They're using clipboards, phones, uh, in some cases, spreadsheets. And so if you think about that, there's a lot of other ways you can organize it. And so um, we, we've built one, and we're continuing to build on it. Uh, but there's a lot of ways where we can use the things that farms already have at their disposal and just organize them better and empower the farms to keep more of the value chain and uh, you know, the retailers to actually still uh, be doing their thing because they don't have very high profit margins as it is. So that's what we're doing and it's happening now, it's not in the future. One thing I forgot to uh, ask you before, but I feel like we can't be at a next gen technology platform without bringing this up is, do you use blockchain and do you have feelings about that in the food system? Um, we have a much more complicated supply chain. Um, if you're thinking about uh, Driscoll's or Dole or whatever, um, if they have a contamination issue, in one sense of the word, if you hear about it, then they're able to just throw all that stuff out and it's kind of, you know, they are dealing with different farms they have contracts with, but it's a lot more integrated. In order to make this system work, where you have diversity of food and uh, you're not, you're working in a local food shed where there's all sorts of different kinds of things going on there. Uh, we do feel as though we need to have the confidence with third parties delivering things uh, that if there is some sort of contamination that's found uh, that we really know that that's where it came from. Um, beyond we don't want to make people sick and there's the public relations issues of having a big massive recall. Um, if we're dealing with all these independent farms and they didn't have a contamination issue, it's, 
it's not fair to them to have to throw out what they have just because they're a part of food shed or because they're a part of something that somebody over across the river was doing. So we have to be very clear and very sure that our traceability is uh, unchanged. Uh, the other thing that we think that's a benefit to blockchain, uh, and there are some other ways to do this, but um, we think that putting a face with the food increases the value of it. We feel, and I think maybe others in this room would agree, that uh, if you don't know where it comes from and it's like hidden in the back room, then it doesn't have value. And the more that the farms become something that you've heard of and that you know about, not only um, does it increase the value for what they're doing and um, you know, the understanding that this is actually how our world works, um, it also uh, provides more opportunities uh, for more people to realize, hey, maybe this is something I want to be doing. Because if you think about uh, vertical farming, which New York, I think, is a leading pioneer in this area. I'm very excited about this. Uh, my business partner is not here today. He started feedback farms here in Brooklyn. And they grew so much uh, that they didn't have enough time to go around to all the places to try to sell it. All their friends were like, look, I have enough of your beets, you know. And, Things were spoiling. So we have to deal with this, how are we going to distribute this stuff problem? And so you all could be farmers with the space that you have. Uh, this is increasingly a reality. Again, something that like, people have been working on incredibly you know, a long time and very hard. Uh, but now it's possible. It's not the future anymore. And so this is the kind of good problem that we have. Um, the reason why blockchain is important for that is all the traceability things I mentioned. But it's going to be really cool when you can actually, this is something that will take a little bit of time. Um, if it's grown by somebody in your neighborhood or wherever it's grown, that I think to some people will be really interesting to find out. And blockchain will help us to make that possible. That's actually a perfect segue into my question for Jason down there. Um, so Jason, as I mentioned before, is, uh, runs an aquaponics farm in Brooklyn. So my question for you, Jason, is that I've seen you talk at other events about how any innovations and in new technologies in agriculture should focus more on growing a diversity of micronutrients as opposed to simply increasing the number of calories that we're, we're growing. Um, and in your opinion, the solution, of course, is indoor farming. Um, but for the most for the farms that I've seen and, and the ones that are exhibiting here, most of them are just growing um, greens, microgreens and herbs, that kind of thing. So I'm curious to know what you think has to happen to get the technology for indoor farming to a place that we can actually grow the full spectrum of, of nutrients that, that we should be having. Yeah, so um, just starting off with like the science of greens. So leafy greens can grow uh, or can provide all of the nutrients that are not fat soluble. So all of the vitamins, minerals that aren't uh, carried by fat. The nutrients that are carried by fat are things like the omega-3 fatty acids, B12, vitamin D, selenium. Um, everything else can be grown by or can be delivered through a leafy green. Um, and so if we're just going to talk about like optimizing indoor farming for the purpose of micronutrient delivery, then leafy greens can do that. Now, from a culinary perspective, I don't know if that's the solution. Um, but if, if we're gonna talk about how can indoor farms grow uh, more of the food on our plate, uh, what we do at Edenworks, as you mentioned, is uh, we do uh, aquaponics. So we're actually running an aquaculture facility, a fish farming facility. We're breaking down the waste from all of the fish that we're growing, um, kind of like brewing beer, but we brew poop into fertilizer using bacteria. Um, and then we grow produce off of all of that fertilizer. Um, now, as a result of that, we are both doing clean produce uh, using fertilizer that's coming directly from animals that's digested by microbes. Uh, it is in line with organic practices. We use all organic practices. Um, we're not certified today. We're in the process of going certified, but we today use all organic practices. Um, but the other aspect is that we're, we are growing fish. Now, uh, it may be surprising to learn that aquaculture, fish farming, is actually the single largest source of protein in the world. Uh, aquaculture is, by market size, the first sale. So every, like, cut fish off the boat um, is about $232 billion. That product, by the time it actually ends up on the consumer's place, plate, is worth something around a trillion dollars globally. It's a massive market. It's growing at twice the rate of the beef market. It's almost twice the market size of beef. 
Um, and so aquaculture is, and, and aquaculture is already more than, uh, more than the entire uh, wild stock of fish that we're harvesting every year. Um, and so that's all to say that by growing fish, we are now in the largest, fastest growing and uh, largest portion of consumers' plates uh, globally. Um, and so that we think is, is a, a massive opportunity. Um, and then, uh, and then a, as we think from also from a culinary perspective, what we're doing with leafy greens is basically doing the first stage of growth. It's like running a nursery, but you're harvesting all of your product out of a nursery. And so the technologies that are kind of fundamental today to vertical farming in terms of growing leafy greens will end up being transformed into the first stage of growth as you kind of transplant out of your nursery and into the broad range of produce that fills the produce aisle in your grocery store today. So are you saying that you would start, let, like let's take cauliflower for example, you would start cauliflower in an indoor farm and then transfer it out of the farm? So you could, you could do it two ways. I mean, we do broccoli greens, for example. Broccoli greens are delicious. It is, it, uh, it's like a super, almost like a meteor uh, green flavor. Um, but uh, so it tastes, it tastes like broccoli with, with all, that, all that richness, a um, little less bitter than a head of broccoli, um, but, uh, but the texture of a leafy green. So there's, there is transforming uh, what, we, what we're used to seeing as a broccoli or as a cauliflower into a different product. And that's already happening on your plate today. Things like, uh, things like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, I mean, they're, they're all they're all the same species of green that have basically been selected for different traits. Um, but that's, it's all, it's kind of like saying, saying, you know, is your dog, is your dog a cockapoo or is, you know, is it a cocker spaniel or is it a poodle? It's still a dog. Um, and so like the whole brassica family, those greens or those, those florets, they're actually, they're all the same product. And so part of it is perhaps um, if, if this farming technology allows us to grow to grow fresher product, if, you're, if the, your, your ultimate goal is freshness, then to what degree do you drive, do you make the market by driving what's on the shelf towards what could be grown indoors and changing what it means to eat a cauliflower or a broccoli, um, or to, to, the, to, to the origin of your question, you can also grow the seedling, um, and then uh, that, can, that can get transplanted into a different geometry of a growing system that's optimized for a taller and wider product. Um, and growing a head of broccoli is kind of like growing a big head of green. So it's instead of doing just a leaf green, like most indoor farms are doing today, it's doing more of a head product. And those technologies exist today already. Um, and so it's just a matter of what does the market, what does the market want and what's the price point for the production uh, using that technology today. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to talk about supply chains or, or indoor farming before we move on to something completely and totally different? No? We're good? All right. Um, so Maggie, can you tell us, sorry, sorry. bad timing. <laughs> um, can you tell us about your space initiative and if what you're working on is about bringing agriculture to other planets? Is it about nutrition and space and space travel or neither of those things? And um, maybe more pressingly, can any of those things be applied to humans while we're still on Earth? Yeah, so I work for MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative where we design, build, and deploy our sci-fi future. And the underlying philosophy is really all about democratizing space travel. So by bringing together artists, designers, engineers, and scientists to all participate in this conversation. I myself am an industrial designer by trade, and now I lead the Space Food Research and Space Sensory Experience Design Program. Um, we're less interested in growing food in space, but more about human interaction and the embodied experience of life in space. And life in space includes long duration space travel and also future habitats on other planets. Some of our research projects are the writing of a zero gravity cookbook where we're exploring what are the unique affordances of zero gravity. So what can you both create and consume in a zero gravity environment that you cannot do here on Earth? So could space inspire new fusion cuisines between interplanetary, for interplanetary travel? Or what new food cultures might emerge by people living on other planets? And 
what do astronauts living on the ISS tell us about their experiences eating and how this influences their perception of culture and self-identity. Um, but most importantly in this cookbook, we are interested in closed loop food systems. So um, some of that does include what can you grow in space and then uniquely create with those items so that you're not constantly relying on foods from Earth. We're of course extremely interested in the 3D printing of food, so both edible materials, but also can we reuse food packaging as a printable, printable material to create new tools for interacting with our foods so that we can achieve the diversity, the same diversity of life that we experience here on Earth, but in space where we have limited resources. Um, VR, virtual reality, um, and scent is extremely important because in space we experience sem sensory deprivation. So can we enhance the sensory experience of food both through virtual reality and these diffused sensory experiences with sounds and colors? So could you augment a pre-meal experience by infusing the smells and sounds of onions being sauteed to both increase astronaut appetite and then make a more enjoyable meal experience? Or could an astronaut visit their favorite restaurant in Italy via virtual reality and experience um, some form of social connectivity and sense of home? Um, what are some of the other fantastic areas we're looking into? We, one of the most important parts of our lab is that we, we deploy all of our designs. So you cannot research space without actually going to space. And that doesn't mean I get to go to space, but can my designs go to space? So some low-hanging fruit would be a zero-gravity flight where we actually fly our designs on simulated um, zero-gravity flights through a parabolic flight maneuver, for those of you who aren't familiar, where you get to see how does the physiology of eating actually change in zero-gravity. Do my bites have to be smaller? Does my sense of taste actually become altered? And then, of course, um, sending our designs to space so that astronauts can interact with them on the International Space Station, and we can have some of our designs existing outside of the space station to see how does that environment um, influence taste. So, for example, I'm right now collecting samples from space to understand how does it smell. So we can analyze these samples on a microbiological level to say, this is what's actually making the International Space Station smell the way that it smells, and therefore I'm tasting my food differently than I would here on Earth. Well, anybody have thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think that there's a way that we could work together because that seems just bringing this stuff from the farm, pulling it out of the ground, making sure that people don't get sick and then getting it to all the different places. We're struggling to do that on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a way we can leapfrog some of the challenges that we have yes. by working together. I agree. And I think that like all space exploration, the mission is always how does this actually impact um, us here today on Earth? So what can these technologies tell us about ourselves and about our planet? So it's not simply just saying, let's all leave forever and eat these things outside, but um, just a lens back at ourselves, really. Well, thank you. Um, all right, so Kim, I'm going to turn to you now with another uh, big, you're working on another big uh, question here. So you said that Google's core aspirational question around food is, how might we contribute to enabling the planet to feed and nourish 10 billion people in sustainable, inclusive, efficient, nutritious, and healthy ways? Um, so I'm curious how Google is doing that, given that it's a, a tech giant serving food rather than an actual food company. Right. So I'm, I'm on the, um, the food team at Google, which is an internal organization responsible for all of the food and food experiences for those who work at Google and our guests and visitors, um, which translates into about 200,000 meals a day in over 250 restaurants in 55 countries. So it's kind of like a medium-sized food and beverage company. And because we're Google, um, we're interested not only in providing these food experiences for those who work there, but how can we influence and shape and be thought leaders within the food space and think about this bigger question. Um, because we, we know that food systems today are unsustainable and leave many in poverty and, and our earth in a poor condition and we're not feeding everybody properly. So one of the ways that, that the food team at Google looks at it is, and it's only one way, we don't have all of the answers, we try to partner with a lot of different organizations. We look at um, 
supporting and inspiring a plant-forward diet and thinking about how we can do that in a corporate food service environment. A lot of it is not just, at Google, we're not just gonna take it away. There's other organizations out there that have just said no more meat. At Google, we believe in uh, offering choice and giving the uh, information and technology for those to make those decisions that are best for them. We look at um, shifting diets to the more plant-forward uh, and balanced way in nudging people using behavioral sciences. We put um, our salad stations front and center uh, so that when you walk into the cafes, that's the first thing you see. And it's all about flavor rules. We were talking, um, Jason was talking about you know culinary and, and these different kinds of, of vegetables and brassica. The way we get to our users is through culinary and the engagement with the chefs. So do the chefs have those skills? It's not super, a lot of people don't find it really easy to uh, cook vegetables and, and make these um, bounce plant forward meals. So how do we give our chefs and inspire other chefs to cook uh, plant forward? So we give them the skills. We also try to give our users these skills and we have teaching kitchens and offer classes. Um, We've partnered with the Better Buying Lab, which is uh, more in the retail market, but you can use a lot of those uh, methods in, your, in our corporate service environment. How you message something, are you just, is it lentil stew or is it spicy Moroccan lentil stew? I want the Moroccan stew. Um, we work on a lot of those things, working with different partners and trying to just be, contribute to feeding the world responsibly, and hopefully inspiring others. Uh, we work with around uh, 50 different companies right now for our robots, and uh, we work with them on menus, on bowls, and things like that. And we are seeing a trend uh, where our customers are asking us for sustainable options for bowls. Uh, our customers ask us to uh, reduce the number of animal proteins we provide through our menus as well. Uh, we are definitely seeing a trend happening, even if, uh, uh, even if it involves costs going up a little bit. Uh, for me, uh, the way I look at it is convenience stores are going to be a huge distribution point in the future for food. And the reason why is a lot of them are losing tobacco revenue in a big way right now. And they're trying to move, and this is because of legislation. And so they're trying to move into fresh food because that's one of the highest margin areas of a convenience store. And so we are seeing huge investment from C stores on fresh food programs. Uh, and now these convenience stores don't have much labor. Uh, they can't afford labor either. There's just one or two people working in a convenience store and they want fresh food 24 seven. And so we are seeing a huge trend towards robotics and these uh, kinds of uh, applications. So you're gonna see a lot of these robots in convenience stores now. Uh, in the next five, five to 10 years. And that's 150,000 stores across the country in every, uh, pretty much in every street of the country, uh, which are going to move towards uh, putting fresh food in their stores. I see it as a huge way to influence the kind of food people eat around the country. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think you're gonna see more and more sustainable options there. You're gonna see these convenience stores move from just pizzas to and hot dogs to more fresh food options we're seeing demand from convenience stores uh, for more fresh food options as well. And to, I see it as a way for us to personally influence all that. To add to, to Deepak's point, the best selling salad product in America right now is the Ready Pack Bistro Bowl. Um, it's a pre-made salad with protein and toppers. It has been the best selling product for like 10 years. Um, and the reason that it has such high uh, sales is because the convenience aspect of it, you can buy that product in convenience stores, you can buy it in Walmart, uh, and everywhere in between. Um, and so making, making uh, fresh, nutritious, sustainable product, products uh, convenient through grab-and-go formats totally transforms markets. Yeah, convenience is a, is a big thing. Making the best choice, the easiest choice, we think a, a lot about that, and then more broadly, right, like where, where are you procuring it? How is it getting to you? How, how are we dealing with our waste? Really trying to, you know, every step of the way, accelerate that circular economy, right? You, you touched on that as well with the, the bowls and 
it's a fascinating subject. Okay, so I want to squeeze in one last question, um, and Shen, last but certainly not least, your work kind of spans the whole spectrum of all these different um, areas of new innovation technology. So I'm curious to know what you think is the most promising technology in the, in the food ecosystem or what has the most capacity for change in the next five to 10 years? Well, I take the, uh, the word technology uh, uh, broadly. I, I think um, the uh, first of all, congratulations to, the, to Lauren and the, and the conference to have such a wide diversity of topics and, and that's part of uh, uh, it's really the fun part of my job to uh, to be uh, uh, to found FoodX four years ago and Food Future Co. two years ago. Uh, Food Accelerator, looking at hundreds of uh, startup ideas and feeling the entrepreneurial energy from all these different aspects and and uh, and, and the supply chain and, and um, high tech, hardcore tech, and cutting edge. Uh, science and tech like microbiome and, um, and various uh, kind of multi parts of solution in urban agriculture, uh, local um, food economy, closed loop regenerative and all of that. But the reason I, I you know, I, uh, but actually uh, uh, a quick show of hands, how many students are here? How many of you are students? How many are food uh, startup uh, founders? Food writers? Anyone work for big food or established food businesses? All right, well, you know, thank you. The, the fact is, uh, whoever I forgot, I mean, it's part of this is just for you to see each other and, and, uh, and, and, and it's surprising that I, I barely could, well, I'm a night person, I mean, I barely made it to the panel, but uh, it's a full room, so, uh, you know, a lot of you probably from Manhattan, you probably have your passport with you, and, and, and uh, the great thing is that you know, it looks like a food movement, a food trend is uh, and alive and well, right? I mean, food is still new black, and I, I just got to say that every time I come to Brooklyn Conference. And then because this is the center of the known food universe, right? I mean, you ask uh, Jason, uh, you, 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 you know, ask Brooklyn people will tell you. But, but, so, so, but another thing is that food is not just new black, it's not just trendy. Food is new internet. I mean, that seems to be to the point, right? So it's a, a full of tech. The reason I, I talked about food, food is a new internet, it's one, it's a central uh, impact on all human aspects of life, hu all aspects of human life, right? And earth, right? So, so uh, it was, I, I used to um, have this phrase that, you know, I, I realized 10 years ago that how agriculture and food is so central to all human challenges we face in the next 20 years. You know, it could be, you know, of course, health and, and environment, but also education and war because transportation and oil. And, and maybe I, I make a caveat. So maybe with the exception of space travel, it's central to every, everything we're facing, every major challenges, right? And apparently it's not, right? I mean, it's how, how we feed, um, you know, healthy, sustainable way uh, astronauts. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, becoming more and more important. But, but one thing, I, I think I, I have a report back to, uh, to this uh, home audience, um, is that for the last year, there are two very, very encouraging trends I'm seeing, right? It's not, uh, I mean, in Brooklyn, we of course know we are what we eat, but it seems like more and more so in mainstream, we understand we are what we eat, eat. You know, so this gets back into the supply chain and, uh, and uh, therefore agriculture and therefore the people who are actually growing things, and there are, a lot of them are under poverty lines. So food is also an issue of poverty, and, and as the panelists have alluded to. So, so, so that's one aspect. The reason that food is also new internet is that it's disruptive. It's not so much, I have to make a little bit controversial point at this, at this conference. It's not food tech, per se. When we look at both the, the massive impact food agriculture can make and the massive opportunity as creating new businesses. Most of those opportunities impact the moving the need of sustainability. It's not necessarily hard tech or, or even tech enabled. It's, it is really new behavior patterns and new uh, uh, marketplaces. And I'll do a shameless plug uh, of two companies. And this, I mean, talking about not hard tech, and this is uh, uh, Frozen Berry. It's now in uh, New Jersey, and, and, and it's one of the companies called Seal the Season. They just use the Flash Frozen. I mean, and the part of I have it in my bag, it's because actually I, I ate this uh, for breakfast uh, on the way over here. There's another one, it's a mushroom made uh, jerky. It's jerky made out of mushroom, right? So, so I mean, the, the, and, and, and the point to, to make about through the season 
is that uh, it's not even organic, it's, uh, it's conventional, but it supports, talking about traceability, it supports, I mean, this, here's uh, a farmer, uh, Gary, you know, and, uh, and it does, it, it changes several things, right? It, it changes transportation, your local consider, let's say, 80 miles around the city center, right? Compared to 150 miles, no, 1,500 miles on average behind each grocery item that travels in this country, right? And, and it happened to something that, of course, is tech enabled, uh, but, uh, but also it tapped into two surprising trends we didn't foresee when we took this company that was only in 10 stores. Now they're in 3,000 stores in two years. Very, very good news for food entrepreneurs that are not particularly tech. One, buying local uh, surpassed buying organic. You know, uh, starting in California two years ago, now generally that's, that's the case in North America, right? And two, convenience. And, and, and uh, you know, fresh and cooking is great, and cooking in the, in the U.S., the story is that cooking is great as long as it's not me, right? So, so uh, you know, frozen, fa fast frozen, supporting local farmers, it, it, it become a dream product to something we, I, we actually misunderstood. I thought, of course, you're organic, right? When I, when I interviewed them. And, 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 and so, so I think that's, uh, if, you, if, if we take a cue from electric cars and uh, renewable energy, what we're looking at in terms of tech is really, I think, uh, disruption is eating the world, not so much hard, hard tech. Right? And, uh, uh, and also, I think uh, sustainability should be eating the world because, uh, as you, many of you may know, the, uh, we passed 1.5 degree right, last month. Right? I mean, that's, uh, this is uh, 1.5 degree above the pre-industrial level. You know, I mean, if we pass two degrees, and most of the uh, environmental scientists uh, will tell you, actually, it's, it is 1.5 degrees. In 10 years, Earth will still be here. We may not, you know. And, and, uh, and so, so uh, um, I think this, uh, this, uh, 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 this sustainability impact that food and agriculture as carbon sink, that's the second report back. Trend, the first one is uh, traceability to agriculture. The second is that the convergence uh, and the mainstream understanding about food agriculture, sus sustainable food agriculture is the largest carbon sink in reverse global warming, more than clean energy. I think those convergence of trends are incredibly important and, and pushing this trend, this movement forward. Um, I, I want, Chen made an incredibly important point and I just wanted to jump in here because when you called it the internet, um, I use this example a lot because if you go to a, a mainstream grocery store, uh, the amount of choice that you have in a produce section is less than people had um, in the 50s and 60s for television. Uh, we aren't yet in, term, in, in cable uh, in terms of our ability to have any sort of diversity in programming there. And what we're trying to do, and we may fail, maybe somebody else will come along and do this, and I really want to say this in front of this many people and make this point now, if you think about what happened in the media infrastructure and the dismediation uh, that, that occurred in the 90s and the 2000s, um, Facebook might be making people sick now. There's evidence that it's actually helping genocides happen. And the food system that we're, we have the opportunity to build here new again uh, could be done as poorly as social media and the rest of the internet has been done. And that's something that I'm really concerned with. There are definite advances here that people can use. And if we use them to make people more sick and have more bad food that's distributed, we all need to be cognizant and watchful of that. I want everybody in this room to hold me accountable if for some reason my thing gets to be one of the major ones uh, that I'm not gonna just ignore. If anybody saw Frontline this week, they'll know what I'm talking about. They're not just gonna ignore people crying for help because they're getting killed um, or just getting bad food. Um, this is that, it, it almost in some cases is more serious, Shen, because um, this is what people need to use in order to live and survive. But on a positive side, what we can do with this, uh, which I think was some of the intentions in the early days of the internet that haven't been realized, is that we could actually get new information. Um, we can get healthier from this. Um, we can realize more about what's going on. And everybody in this room needs to be aware of this because people were not aware of what was going on during the uh, 1.0 and 2.0, and I think fortunately now people are starting to get aware of what happened uh, on the internet when people were just left to their own devices. 
I think we're out of time. So thank you guys so much for this discussion. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. You can find them afterwards to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you.